morning, Trinity. Good morning. Let's do that again. Good morning, Trinity. Good morning. That's much better, especially in light of what's happening in the DMV these days. Do you agree? For those of you who have been lamenting the Washington football team's uh, troubles, rejoice and be glad. <laughs> The Mystics won last week. And the Nationals are two games up on the St. Louis Cardinals. Rejoice and be glad. Even though sometimes things seem to not be going the way you want them to go. There's always something to rejoice and be glad in. I am deeply grateful to Father Harmon for extending this invitation to preach on this auspicious occasion. You're celebrating quite a few things today. 126 years of ministry. This is your 16th homecoming. And it is the 19th anniversary. Am I right, Father Holland? Is this your 19th year? Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> I retired from St. George's after putting in 21 years. It was time for me to go because I had reached the age of maturity. <laughs> I want us to focus this morning on this text from the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 17, verses 17 through 18. Jesus asks, None of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner. Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? One of the things I remember about growing up, about my parents, I remember them always saying to me, always say please and thank you. Especially thank you when you receive a gift. Not only when you receive a gift, if you get a dinner invitation, say thank you. Even if the meal was not so good, <laughs> say thank you. I'm sure you would agree with me, we all like to be thanked, do we not? And we may feel disappointed or hurt when our gifts are unacknowledged. Especially when we have put a lot of time and effort in choosing the gift that we give. And to not receive a thank you and acknowledgement of the gift, it hurts us, does it not? I don't know about you. But when I give a gift, I'm expecting, even if you don't like it, you expect a what? A thank you because what? You were thinking about someone and you put in a lot of effort to get that gift. Walking up and down the aisle, putting in mental brain power, especially if you're giving something to the one you love, to my wife. I give a lot of effort and thought. Because of what? Because I love her. And I want her to be pleased in terms of what I give her. One thing I appreciate about my wife, if I give her a gift, she will say, thank you, where's the receipt? <laughs> <laughs> when a gift, is received with gratitude, a significant exchange is completed, and the relationship between the giver and the one who is received, the gift is strengthened. But when thanks are not expressed, there is a sense, if you will, of incompleteness. Did the giver mean anything? More importantly, does the giver mean anything to the person who received the gift? Our story in today's gospel lesson echoes our experience of giving and being thanked, or sometimes giving and not being thanked. The 
gospel tells us that Jesus is traveling in border country along the frontier between Galilee, Jewish territory, and Samaria, a place of strangers, people of alien beliefs and customs. As Jesus approaches the village, ten lepers come as close as they can, as close as they can, maybe 50 feet from where Jesus is crying out to him to have mercy on them. Jesus tells them to go and show themselves to the priest. Now notice, Jesus doesn't even need to come near them, doesn't need to touch them. He just says to them, his word, go, show yourselves to the priest. And so they do what Jesus commands. And on their way to the priest, their healing becomes apparent. As they're walking toward the priest, the leprosy disappears. They are made whole and can belong to their families and their village again. Think about how it is so devastating to be frozen out, to be told, we don't want you near us. You are diseased. Don't come near me. Some places we would have to ring a bell to let people know that you were present so they could scatter to get away from you because you were diseased. But these lepers are now made whole and they can go back to their families and their villages again. And so the healed lepers hurry to the priest. But one of them knows that something else must happen first. Before he can truly enjoy what he has received, he must thank the giver. So he returns praising God and prostrates himself in gratitude before Jesus. And Jesus asks, were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Although God doesn't give just to those who are likely to respond gratefully, God's gifts do come in order to create and deepen the relationship. So gratitude, which is a sign of someone responding to God and not just enjoying what God gives, does matter to Jesus. There is a sense of disappointment or sadness as he asked about the other nine. Didn't they get the point? Weren't they you too? Where are they? Do they not appreciate what has been done for them? Why did only one man cleanse from leprosy return? Thank you. Someone has made a list of nine suggested reasons why the nine did not return. One, first reason. One way to see if the cure was real. Second reason. One way to see if it would last. Third reason, one said he would see Jesus later. Fourth reason, one decided that he had never had leprosy in the first place. Hi. Fifth reason, one said he would have got well anyway. Sixth reason, one gave glory to the priest. Seventh reason, one said, oh well, Jesus really didn't do anything. Mm. Eighth reason, any rabbi could have done it. Mm. Ninth reason, I was already much improved. It's not surprising, is it? In fact, it often seems that the more we have, the less gratitude we may feel. But this story isn't just about the importance of gratitude. Its punchline is that the leper who returned to give thanks to Jesus wasn't a Jew. He was a Samaritan. As elsewhere in the Gospels, think of the Canaanite woman. Think about the Roman centurion, the Good Samaritan. It is the despised foreigner, the religious outsider, who becomes a model to challenge the disciple. It is only the Samaritan who completes the exchange of salvation celebrated with thanksgiving. It is he who embodies true humanity before God. Humanity healed, humanity 
This is worth pondering. Are we open to what God might teach us through those beyond our own community, those we might easily regard with fear and suspicion, those whom we would rather build a wall? <coughs> George Herbert once prayed, Thou who has given so much to me, give one thing more, a grateful heart. We must pray for a grateful heart because ingratitude is never far away and grumbling often comes much more naturally than thankfulness. Sometimes we concentrate more on what we don't have than what we do have. We do not concentrate on what God has given us. How much does it cost for a prayer? Think about it. How much does it cost to have people in your life who care about you, who support you, who are there for you when things are not going like you expect them to go? Or someone who says to you, when you're feeling down and out, don't worry about it. We're here for you. God loves you, and I love you too. Because God loves me, I love you. Because God assists me, I will assist you. Think about it. You know, the older I get, the more I appreciate the little things in life. The simple things in life. I'm not going into any graphic detail. But the little things in life. Like waking up in the morning and looking over and seeing somebody you love next to you. I'm grateful. Somebody who cares for you. I'm grateful for that. The ability, you know, someone will say, well, how are you doing today? I said, I'm doing great. He said, well, what, why are you doing so great? So I woke up this morning. I knew who I was. I knew where I was. Hmm. I knew who I was married to. Hmm. I knew where I was going. And I knew how to get on. The simple things in life. Give me thanks. Give me one more thing of grateful heart. But how do we cultivate a grateful heart like the Samaritan left? Perhaps the clue lies in the very fact that he is a Samaritan. A Samaritan, especially a Samaritan leper, can expect no favors from a Jew. He's got a double whammy. Not only did the man have leprosy, but he was also a Samaritan. And notice this. As long as the ten had leprosy, they were together. They did not care about who was a Samaritan and who was a Jew. What is it about the human condition? If somebody can explain this to me. That when we're facing the same kind of affliction, the same kind of disaster, we can come together. But as soon as help or healing comes to one group, the other group says, we don't want you around us anymore. What is it about the human condition? When they all had leprosy, they were together. Who knows? Maybe they told the Samaritan, we're going back to our Jewish community. You can't come with us. Yeah, we've been together. We suffered the same affliction. But now things have changed. So you go back to your people, and we'll go back to our people, and we will pretend that nothing, we did not know each other. Samaritan had a double win. He has absolutely nothing to offer Jesus. This is not transactional. He cannot put Jesus in his debt. He has no hold on Jesus, not even shared grace. So what the Samaritan receives from Jesus is sheer grace. It is a gift, and he knows it's a gift. He is a model for us because he knows his need. What is that him? I need thee what? Yeah. Every hour. Every hour I need thee. Every hour I need thee. He knows his needs. 
He knows he can do nothing, and he knows that he has received grace. So he is grateful. So he is grateful. I remember attending the World Christian Student Federation Conference in Paris some years ago. It was in a town, uh, Chanty. You know, here we call it Chantilly. <laughs> Chantilly. <laughs> And I had gone over a week before my wife was to join me. So she was flying in, I think it was order. And I needed to get there. Now, I didn't speak the language. My sense of direction is not the best. Thank God for the GPS. <laughs> <laughs> I went to one of the coordinators of the conference and said, well, my wife's flying in and I need to get to the airport. How do I get there? Can anybody take it? She said, no, you'll have to take the bus. And then you got to get on the train. And then you got to get to the metro. And then you get to the airport. Well, of course, you know, I could have ended up in Lyon. So, <laughs> so I'm standing there. I've got nothing to offer. This is no transaction. All of a sudden, one of the other coordinators who happened to overhear my conversation with this coordinator who was going to send me on all of these other transportation places says, I'll take you. I'll take you. Now, you're talking about being grateful, <laughs> being thankful, and praising God. Hmm? I mean, I wanted to break out with, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Right? He drove me to the airport, we picked up my wife, and then drove, drove us back to where we were staying in Shanti. I was so elated. I thanked him profusely. I said, is there anything I can do for you? He said, no. No. There's nothing you can do for me beyond what you've already done, and that is the thing. You know, God comes to us in times and places and through people we would never expect, never expect. I could do nothing. I knew that I had received God's grace, and so I was grateful. Mrs. Uno Jinja, a severely disabled Japanese Christian, wrote a poem communicated through the movements of his eyelids, which makes the same point I made. Mean. Jinzo knows that he himself can do nothing for his family or for his people or for God. But what he can do is give thanks for God's love for all those people. Jinzo writes, I just give thanks. I just To understand grace, brothers and sisters, and so become truly grateful, it does help to be in a situation of utter dependence. This makes it harder to have any illusions about what we have to offer God. If we have illusions that we're doing God a favor by gathering in this church on this Sunday morning, then we need to dispel those delusions, do we not? As most of us are not lepers or severely disabled, we may struggle fully to recognize our dependence on God, but we can recognize that this is what we need to learn. What does that other hymn say? Leaning on the what? The everlasting arms. Each and every day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Now, those everlasting arms are on. Are they our arms? Whose arms are they? God's arms. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Arms that do not withdraw their embrace because they're ticked off at us. Arms that do not withdraw their embrace because we made a man. 
arms that do not withdraw their embrace because we have to have a different opinion about some something or the other. Arms that are what? Everlasting, that will always hold you tight and never let you go. All of us are sustained, are sustained by God's constant love and no one is excluded by the saving work of Jesus Christ. Jesus never abandons those whom he loves. Is there one person in ten who realizes this and thanks the Lord? Do we ourselves thank him one time in ten? The matter is in doubt, is it not? Is it not easy to say thanks when you think that all you have is a gift from you? When you are only concerned about yourself, when you are only impressed by yourself. As someone once said, do not believe your own propaganda. <laughs> 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 do not believe your own propaganda. You see, brothers and sisters, the work of the Lord will only be operative and effective when we, in turn, are totally open and give back to the Lord. You know, we, we, we talk about stewardship, we talk about time, talent, and treasure, the three Gs. I like the three S's. <laughs> self, substance, and service. Giving of self. Giving of our substance and being in service to God's people. We would do well to remember those words, these words from Blessed Francis of Assisi. Do not keep any part of yourself back for yourself so that you will be able to receive in full measure the one who gives himself completely to you. God can't come in if you're full of yourself. Huh? God can't, he, God can't give you anything because what? You think you got it all. Mm. <laughs> Do not keep any part of yourself back to yourself. What's that other here? All to thee, I surrender. I surrender all. Not I surrender one eight. <laughs> I surrender one four. Mm -mm. I surrender all. All the jazz song. Why not take all of me? How many of y'all know that song? I know that song. Why not take all of me? Do not keep any part of yourself back for yourself so that you will be able to receive in full measure the one who gives himself completely. The sacrament of the Holy Eucharist embodies and realizes everything that we have been talking about. It is the action through which Jesus Christ saves, nurtures, and transforms us. It is also the means through which we, re we render full thanks to the Lord and give back to him the praise and glory his grace and mercy deserve. Just as I am, without one plea, but thy blood was what? Shed for me. I come. I come. These words from Eucharistic Prayer 1 of the Book of Common Prayer eloquently expresses this thought. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all of us shall be partakers of this holy communion. May worthy receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and made one body with him, that he may dwell in us, and we in him. Yes, brothers and sisters, Jesus gives to all of us, showering each of us with love. Do we take that love? And those gifts for granted.
that we turn back to God in overwhelming praise and thanksgiving and then allow God's love and generosity to overflow through us and toward others in need. Another hymn comes to mind. Great is thy faithfulness. Everybody knows that hymn, right? Do you know that hymn is based on a verse in Lamentations chapter 20, chapter 3, verse 23? What is Lamentations about? The people's city has been destroyed. They've been taken out into exile. The temple is gone. And if you read that book, it talks about my bones are broken. But yet I know this, the steadfast love of the Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Even in the midst of tough times, I know the Lord God is with me. I know Jesus walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own. Talk about praise. Not praise just when things are going right, but praise when things are not going as you expect them to go. Or as Cannonball Adams said when during the preface of his um, tune, Walk Tall, when things don't lay like they're supposed to lay, you gotta walk tall. When things don't lay like they're supposed to lay, praise God and give thanks. Give thanks and praise his holy name. Through the youth, we give the Lord Jesus thanks for all the benefits of his loving kindness. And we want to respond to that loving kindness. The little pamphlet put out by Ford Movement. Stewardship is simply a response to love. A response to love. Jesus is not an, act, um, an extortionist. Jesus is not an extortionist. Jesus will love you regardless. Regardless. So what you do is you give in response to the benefits, the blessings that you have received. That's not extortion. That's simply love. Simply love. Through the Eucharist, we give the Lord Jesus thanks for all the benefits of his loving kindness. When we come up to the altar rail, nobody's going to ask you to fill out a place, God. <laughs> nobody's going to do that. Father Hama is not going to say, well, he don't be my Lord. Doesn't work that way. Jesus is not an extortionist. Jesus is a lover. Jesus is a giver. And what he essentially is saying to us, as have been given to you, you give unto others. By participating in the Eucharist, we proclaim thanks to the Lord and praise his most holy name. So, brothers and sisters, let our Lord's most holy word and this most holy blessed sacrament be our source of thankful giving and thankful living now and always. And let us keep in mind this. I can do nothing. Thou who has given so much to me, give one thing more. A grateful and loving heart. Jesus asks, none of them found to return and give praise to God except this for In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.